ask us a question? Would you prefer that? If, I mean, sure. I'm Up afraid I'll get to unmute, so I'm going to leave well we'll enough. Leave it on. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I can see folks filling in right now. Welcome, welcome. If you are here for a discussion on um, a recent Alta magazine article on the Pacific Crest Trail, you are in the right place. So come on in. We're going to wait just a, a few seconds while all of our attendees fill up this room and we will get started. Toot sweet. All right. 12.31, I'm going to out more. Welcome, welcome. So my name is Beth Spotswood. I'm Alta's digital editor. Um, and I'm, I'm so grateful to everyone for taking the time today to join us for Alta Live. This is the digital event series at Alta Journal. We're a quarterly magazine focused on California and the West. Today, I am really happy and delighted to welcome three guests. This is, this is a lot of guests for us today. So we're gonna, we're gonna try and move quickly so that we can get to your questions at the end. Um, each of them have a very deep connection to a powerful article that appears in the current issue of Alta. Um, I'm sure many of you have found it online. Writer Louise Farr, who joins us here today, details the story of Trevor Lair, a 22-year-old with a passion for the outdoors who hiked the Pacific Crest Trail in March of last year. Tragically, Trevor fell to his death just eight days into his hike. Cameron Dickinson, a member of the Riverside Mountain Rescue Unit who responded to the scene, joins us, as does Trevor's dad, Doug Lair. Doug is channeling his grief into warning people about the dangers of the trail. And according to Louise's article, plans to retrace his son's steps later this year. We're going to speak with Louise, Cameron, and Doug, and then take as many questions, as many of your questions as we can. So please do use the question button below um, to submit a question for any one of our guests. This interview will be recorded and posted to altaonline.com later today. If you're here, you've registered with an email. So I'm gonna shoot you an email following this event with links to the video, um, anything, Louise's article, anything that we've discussed today that, that I think you might be interested in. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to, to kind of get us going. And again, questions, use that question button down below. So Louise, thank you so much for, for joining us. How did you, hear about Trevor's story and what inspired you to write about it for Alta? I was actually investigating another accident that happened in the same mountain range. Uh, I believe Cameron was on that rescue as well. It happened a month later. It was a helicopter uh, rescue. And while I was looking into that as a possible story, I somehow stumbled across an item in the Desert Sun newspaper that mentioned a hiker falling to his death. It didn't mention who it was, but I looked into it and eventually reached Doug and found out more about Trevor and just felt compelled to tell this really sad story. It seems that, that so many of the people that you interviewed for this article, including Trevor's, I mean, Trevor's whole family, his hiking companions, um, the rescue personnel, the people who are very involved in the Pacific Crest Trail kind of hardcore community, um, they all seemed really eager to discuss this particular story. Why do you think that is? I just think it resonates with everybody. Um, the people who live in the little towns off the trail are very connected to the hikers that come through. Uh, the family, of course, want maybe didn't necessarily want to talk about it, but I think Doug hoped they would talk about it and they did so because they wanted the story to be accurate and they wanted, they wanted really to give a picture of Trevor who was not really the nerd that he described himself as. He, he was a kid who wanted to climb Everest. He, he danced at music festivals with his girlfriend. He, he was just an all round amazing guy and everybody wanted his name to be known. Is there anything in your article or anything that, that you kind of discovered that didn't, that didn't make the article that you can share with us? 
oh goodness, there was so much stuff. There was really so much material. Um, I, I was very interested in the little towns uh, uh, where Trevor had stopped. He, he missed the town of Julian, uh, which was before uh, Barrel Springs. And it was a place where he had agreed later with Doug that he would get off the trail for a while. And um, because of the virus, he didn't stop in Julian. And my feeling is that had he been able to stop in Julian, he would have met um, a supplier there uh, who has a, a, an outfit called Two Foot Adventures. And I'm sure she would have advised him on the kind of equipment that he needed coming up ahead. And because they had already been through these terrible blizzards, I think all of the hikers in that party would probably have picked up microspikes and uh, ice axes along the way. Um, Trevor is, Trevor, Trevor um, was in a really, really experienced outdoors person, <coughs> um, but, but had never done any part of the Pacific Crest Trail before. And one of the things that I was struck by in your article was that, um, I don't know if community is the right word, but there's a culture of people who are really hardcore into the PCT. And I'd known it from Cheryl Strade's book, Wild. It was a, a memoir that was made into a movie starring Reese Witherspoon. And I watched that movie and was like, oh, I could do this. I should go find myself. Um, but Louise, can you talk a little bit about that culture, the, the, the kind of diehard culture of um, people who do these long, long thousand mile hikes? Well, they are absolutely devoted to hiking and they post videos, nonstop videos of themselves on the trail and they connect with each other through different websites and through um, a blog on the Pacific Crest Trail Association website. And uh, they're absolutely passionate about it, angry if things don't work out well. They became inflamed some of them who had to get off the trail when other people stayed on the trail. And um, it's just a very fascinating kind of group of people. They're very brave and adventurous. And I was struck by the sort of, it's almost the selfishness that you have to have if you have an obsession like that. You cannot do something like that and be worried about your family. You have to just go ahead and do it as with any kind of obsession. And I think what I learned most about Trevor while he was on the trail was that I don't think anything was going to stop him. When someone dies, people are left with those thoughts. What if I'd said this? What if I'd said that? I don't think anything would have stopped Trevor. He was so happy on the trail. Um, thank you. Thank you, Louise. So I'm going to switch over to you, Cameron. You are... Um, I'm a volunteer member of the Riverside Mountain Rescue Unit. And, and we spoke about this, um, we did a little practice session on Monday. Um, can you just tell us really quickly what happens when there's an incident, um, like what happened to Trevor? What, what is the process when you get a call that someone is in trouble um, in your section of the mountains? Yeah, so, so usually it starts with a 911 call. That 911 call will go to our call captain with the team. And from there, that call will be distributed out to the team that we have a mission. And it, there's a little bit of detail that goes into, you know, what type of mission we have and where we need to meet up. Um, and, and the call that we got from, from Trevor was just like any other call. A call came in. Uh, we, we were under the understanding initially that it was a, a fallen climber and we didn't know a whole lot of detail that moment in time. And, um, and so, yeah, we, we responded. Yeah. Um, I, I know that after, I don't know if it was a few days after um, or longer, but you went back to the scene of the accident to retrieve um some of Trevor's belongings or as many as you could. I, I assume it pretty some pretty serious danger to yourself. Can you tell me why it was important to do that? Well, I, you know, it, it, it you know, I'm a hiker and, uh, you know, and I, you know, I felt a lot of, uh, a lot of sympathy to, to Doug. He, 
he lost his son, you know, he reached, you know, we've had some conversations, um, you know, he talked about, you know, the fact that he wanted to get his hands on some of his son's gear. And so it wasn't until, I think it was a few months, couple, two or three months after the actual accident, it was in the, uh, I want to say it was in the summertime, uh, late, late, uh, late spring, summer, uh, when it was decided between myself and another team member to actually go help dug out by retrieving this gear. It's, uh, you know, it's a steep incline, but it was, it was dry. We didn't have a lot of the same conditions that, uh, uh, that we had on that, on that fateful day. But, um, mm -hmm. but we went down and we collected probably 90% of some of his belongings. And, uh, so we were able to package it up and, and mail it back to, to Doug. It was, it was important for me. You know, I felt a sense of connection. I mean, I was there on the, on that day of the accident and, um, yeah, I definitely felt some, some sympathy and wanted to help out any, any way I can. So you mentioned the conditions of that day and, you know, we've, we've talked about, and Louise really, um, expresses that Trevor was an ex incredibly experienced long, I don't know, you know, long hiker. Like I, he, he did some really nationally famous big hikes. Um, and yet even he kind of succumbs, you know, the elements surprised him. Can you, how mm -hmm. are, are many people are, in addition to the people who are the hardcore hikers, that it's their passion, it's their life. Um, are hikers often surprised? Is, is there a lot we don't know about how truly dangerous this section yeah. of the hike or the whole hike is? Yeah, you know, these, these conditions were not all that out of the ordinary. We have, we get to know in those mountains. Um, and uh, that location seems to get people. It's, uh, it's on an east, east face, so it's shaded. There's snow that lasts there longer. You might see most of the snow melted on the southwest uh, exposures, but you'll still have snow on that face of the mountain, on that eastern face, and it's pretty steep, so it stays shaded for quite a quite a while. Um, we had a couple snowstorms um, that were spaced apart about a week before the accident occurred. So that first uh, storm. We got about a foot and a half of snow. Um, and then during that course of that week, that snow thawed and refreezed, um, you know, multiple times. And then we got a fresh layer of snow, about six inches of snow. I want to say the day before uh, the passage where, um, you know, where we had, um, you know, Doug's son come through. And it was just, we had soft, fresh snow on top of hard pack underneath. And it was just, just the, just a slippery condition. And um, but that location um, is is pretty dangerous. And um, yeah, I, th I think the only thing he could have done is really just had some micro spikes or some crampons traversing that that stretch. But um, it was just the the perfect storm. Yeah. Yeah. Um. All right, Doug. Let's go to you. Can you please unmute? There you go. Thank you so much for joining us from um, the Dallas Fort Worth area or what you have recently taught me is known as the Metroplex. Um, I'm grateful. I'm, we're all really grateful that you've taken the time to be here today and share parts of um, your son with us. So thank you. Quite welcome. Um, I, I, I'm hoping that you can um, kind of ex help me understand we're both parents it's been less than a year since your son passed away. And yet here you are um, talking about him. And I, I know it's, it's gotta be really tough. What, um, you know, you're telling a story and you're trying to educate strangers. Can you tell us just right off the bat, what changes already have you helped put into place? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, the the waves of grief have been intense yeah um very much so just when you think you can get your head above above water another wave of grief knocks you over um and the most important thing for me was to try to find some way to stay connected to trevor and considering his deep love of hiking 
it only made sense for me to try to immerse myself a bit more into the hiking culture and, and specifically into the PCT. I've spent several conversations with Cameron and uh, Eric, who also um, uh, is a rescuer with the RMRU uh, and several other people along the trail. And it has just talking to these individuals, sharing Trevor's story, making sure that the world knew who he was, how much he loved hiking, but most importantly, to educate people about the dangers. Um, and my focus as of about two months, two months, three months ago, maybe, has shifted from telling his story to telling his story as a cautionary tale that this can happen to anyone and, and really preach the message of safety out on the trail, making sure that you not only have the right equipment, but that you know how to use it. Um, and the response that I've had from those messages and of course from, from Louise's article has just, it's been overwhelming the last couple of weeks. And in full transparency, these last 10 to 12 days have been the most rewarding time since Trevor's accident for me because I just feel that he's making a difference. Uh, that's extraordinary. Thank you. We're, we're getting some questions for you specifically, Doug, so I'm going to dive into those now. Sure. Um, did Trevor try and find a hiking companion to do the trail with, or did he particularly want to do it solo? Well, you have to understand that <clears throat> I think it's natural for a lot of people to ask the question, my goodness, you're going to go out and do this 2,650 mile hike. You of course want to do it with a companion, but the reality is, is that the Pacific Crest Trail Association issues 50 permits per day. So you are starting the trail each day with 50 other hikers. And typically within 24 to 48 hours, you start to migrate and start forming a hiking bubble, what they, what they refer to it. And so during breaks uh, for lunch, for example, or when you set up your camp at the end of the day, it's very common for people to, to congregate, to come together, and then they form what, what many refer to as a trail family. So Trevor did not go out there with the intention uh, of hiking with a friend, but he knew that shortly into the, into the trail that he would find some people that he would start hiking with, and uh, that's exactly what he did. And he was with two of those people. Yes. Um, when the accident occurred. So you are, you're planning on, on hiking at least the part um, that Trevor did? Yes, that, yeah, that was our plan. I was going to do that with my father, um, God bless him. And um, one of my high school best friends who was also deeply entrenched into the hiking culture. Uh, we were going to go out there in September and do the last 30 miles of his hike from um, uh, a, a restaurant called Paradise Valley Cafe, which is very notorious on the trail. And we were going to hike to the accident site, spend some time there, and, and then finish the rest of his trail that he was going to do that day into Idlewild. Um, and you're still planning on doing this? Unfortunately, 48 hours before we were, we were to fly out to, to uh, the Southern California last year, the forest fires closed down several of the national hiking trails um, of which the PCT um, and the San Jacinto wilderness was included. And uh, the permanent, that, excuse me, the permit that I had applied for had been revoked. And with the poor air quality, the fact that we weren't going to be able to hike and several other reasons, we just decided that perhaps Trevor is trying to tell us that that was not the right time for our family to be out there. Um, that makes sense. Cameron, I'm gonna shift to you. Can you unmute? Can you, um, Cameron, can you comment on the role of satellite communications in this particular incident? Yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's a it's a tool that uh, can can save your life. You know, not not everybody has satellite communications, but 
you know, in, in reach is, is one of the common ones. And of course the cell phone, uh, you know, where you have a signal is important. Um, but in reach is, is a great tool to reach out to those uh, when you do not have a, you know, a cell signal, you can do uh, two way communications. And, um, and it's, it's a great way to quickly, you know, call 911. Um, you know, there's features in there to allow you to to, uh, to connect quickly uh, when there is an emergency. So it's definitely nice to, nice to have when you're doing a, a hike of this extent. Did you use, and you used this on the day that Trevor fell? Satellite communications? Yeah, so as, as far as our communications, usually those communications are, are for the hikers themselves, but in terms of the communications of, our, of the rescuers, uh, yeah, we have two-way radios and uh, we have, uh, you know, communications with our command. So, yeah, we're always uh, communicating amongst ourselves um, during these missions. Cameron, can you tell us off the top of your head, what are two or three of the greatest preventable causes of hiking tragedies? It's preparation. You know, it's, uh, you know, and this, there's, there's different levels of preparation, depends on the time of the year. Uh, of course, in this case, you know, having micro spikes or crampons uh, when the conditions are, are snowy um, and, and iced over. Uh, we also get a lot of heat related in the summertime. So hydration and carry more than you think you would need. Um, and, uh, and warm weather clothing you know, uh, have extra layers. Uh, we, we do deal with a lot of, you know, hypothermia type calls. So have extra layers and warm layers. And, um, and so those are some of the more obvious ones um, that come to mind. Doug, I know you shared a lot of this with Louise in her research and writing of this article, article but can you tell us a little bit about um, Trevor's research and preparation and passion for this hike in particular? Um, so Trevor had reached out to me um, in uh, 2019. He was a senior, uh, actually a junior at the time at uh, the Ohio State University. He was a computer science major, reached out to me and said that he had a plan to which he was going to graduate early. Um, uh, and it was his goal by graduating early that he could spend that time that he saved to, to hike the PCT. And so our agreement was that he needed to get himself into top physical conditioning. He worked out three to four times a week, ran about 30 miles a week. He did guided meditation from a mental preparation standpoint. But my promise to him was that I would be his trail manager, so to speak, and that I would do the vast majority of the uh, preparation for him. So that was, that was my role and responsibility. And sadly, I failed him on, on this particular day. You did not. You absolutely, I, I you know, I, as a fellow parent, I aspire hearing the descriptions of Trevor and your love for him. You, what an incredible relationship, the two of you have um it's beautiful and and what a wonderful gift to give your son to be his partner on that um louise someone would like to know when you know you had to reach out to to doug and to trevor's family to to really do this article um how did you do that what was that like and how did you know did you know that doug would be as open and willing as he is of course, I had absolutely no idea. You know, when you pick up the phone as a writer and call someone, it's a very sensitive situation. You don't know if anyone is going to speak to you. First of all, you usually don't even know if you've got the right phone number. And it just so happened that I called Doug on a Saturday afternoon and he picked up because he saw that it was a Los Angeles area code and assumed that it had something to do with Trevor. And we had quite a long conversation that day, I think, Doug. And uh, we 
eventually, of course, spoke for hours. And um, it was, they were very sad, difficult conversations, but of course, the family was so forthcoming. And I have to say that it was one time that I was happy that I wasn't doing the interviews in person because I could sort of snuffle quietly at the other end of the phone while I was listening to this really tragic story. I could not believe that Trevor had actually died while I was writing the piece. It sounds ridiculous, but. Um, no, it's an incredibly emotional. I mean, all around, it's just emotional. Um, Michelle asks Doug, unmute please, Doug. Um, I'm actually relieved that you will be postponing your PCT hike. What will be your focus or your mission for the rest of the year in order to keep Trevor's experience alive and meaningful? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I have been, um, and I, I feel like I need to be careful. Uh, right now, many through hikers are in deep preparations for their upcoming hike. So this is the time in which most people are listening the most. Uh, that won't be the case, for example, this summer. Um, so I have a window of opportunity to communicate uh, my safety mm -hmm. message, but I also don't want to become white noise to the, to the through hiking community. So I think that I need to be strategic in, in my messaging and, and um, be forthcoming and how I go about doing things because I, that's the worst thing that I could uh, see happening is for people to just say, oh. Oh yeah, that's the dad of, of the dead hiker. And it's a sad story, but I've heard his message before. So, um, so I've, uh, have some podcasts, uh, that I've worked with some, with some organizations that, uh, will be released soon. Um, and I have some other collaborations that are all focused around, uh, safety in and around the Pacific Crest trail near Idlewild, uh, near the accident site. Cameron, in your opinion, is the PCT becoming too heavily used by thrill seekers similar to Everest? Are there any criteria hikers must meet or show they're familiar with so that they're prepared to hike the trail? I, I don't think uh, it's it's gotten quite that bad. Um, I think uh, the PCT does get a lot of a lot of traffic, um, and um, but you know I I just think that uh, that people that um, that are going to hike the the full length of the PCT. Just do some physical and you know preparations. Do your research. You know for staging, you know materials and supplies um, up ahead on the trail. Uh, mapping mapping is important. You know it's even though the PCT trail is pretty well traveled. You know you want you want to keep your mapping. You want to just just be prepared uh, for that extents that, that extensive of a, of a hike um so yeah um helen asked a question and and i i guess we can you know make this to the very specific location where trevor was but how fast can emergency workers get to these dangerous spots what's the wait time from that night the initial 911 call to help showing up yeah so, so up in Idlewild, there is uh, the fire department. They, they're usually first on scene and they can be there within you know, a few minutes, depends on the location. But if there's a, a mission where it's off the trail, off the road, uh, back in their ways, then it's gonna take longer for them to access an injured or a, a hiker in need. So usually you know, search and rescue members are dispatched to either hike to that location or we utilize our helicopters, depends on the emergency. Uh, we'll use our helicopters to drop us in there. And it could be, you know, 30, 40, 45 minutes is, is usually a turnaround time to get somebody out there um, on emergency, but it, but it varies. Yeah. Wow. Um, Doug, I just have, you've got to read the comments because everyone loves you, by the way. Thanks that you're an amazing dad. Um, can you, someone's asking you very, Cameron, um, does your SAR unit ever use ham radio for communications? Uh, we, we don't, we don't use ham radios. Um, I think it's, uh, 
it's something that we don't necessarily need for for our um, for our team. Uh, most of the radios that we use, we we have repeaters uh, to get to get uh, radio signal in some of the further away locations in our mountains. But uh, but yeah, typically we use just two way radio um, and, um, and and use of our repeaters to to be able to communicate amongst ourselves and to our command post. Do hikers ever rope themselves together during dangerous parts um, of the trail like the one Trevor was on? Yeah, we don't, we don't see that uh, too often. Um, and you, usually it's, you know, if the conditions are right, it's probably not a, a bad idea to, to do that. Um, you know, especially where you have a lot of exposure uh, but usually it's, you don't see that too often. Yeah. So the, the use of, uh, you know, um, ice axes and self arrest are, are something that's more common on an individual basis per person basis is to self arrest if you do fall. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's not too often that we, that we have uh, hikers that link themselves together rope themselves together and um so Cameron what inspired you to to take on this role well I um you know I I'm just you know just a just a hiker a backpacker and um and uh you know I I enjoy the outdoors I enjoy helping people and this is is just made sense to me I you know, I first looked into search and rescue. I'm in my later 40s now, but in my 20s, I looked into it. Unfortunately, I lived too far away to respond to calls in a timely manner when there's, you know, when there's when there's uh, when there's uh, an injured hiker uh, or a lost hiker. But when I moved to Riverside County um, about uh, 10 years ago, I started looking into search and rescue again and found that I was close proximity to our San Jacinto mountains. And there was a, a rescue team there. And I said, you know, why not? Why not, uh, you know, help people and enjoy, you know, getting and outdoors and hiking and, and helping people at the same time. So that's, and I started uh, just right around seven years ago, about 19 or 2013 is when I started in, in search and rescue. As we, as we end our half hour discussion, I, I wanna, let me double check that I haven't missed super important questions as we run out of time. Oh, um, this, this is important. I, I guess Louise or Doug might know the answer to this one. Did the two, did Trevor's two companions who he had, his trail family that he had connected with continue on the hike and how have they been affected since the accident? Uh, Cody uh, McMahon who, um, finished the hike before the other hiker, Yannick, was very deeply affected. And I believe Yannick was as well. Um, Cody had to check in with um, psychologist colleagues back in Brisbane, Australia, where he works for a nonprofit. And I think that helped him a great deal. Also, he told me that he was uh, very grateful to have long discussions with Doug. That helped him a lot when he was on the trail. Um, I'd, I'd like to just mention a couple of things about safety. Um, we talk about the importance of having, carrying an ice axe and having crampons, but it's also very important that people learn how to use them, not just put them in their backpack and set off and then be taken by surprise. Um, John King, who uh, has the San Jacinto Trail Report, he has a good online video that can teach people how to, how to use an ice axe. And um, well, I was speaking to somebody from the PCTA the other day, and he mentioned that people are absolutely obsessive now about cutting down the weight in their backpacks. And that is leading to accidents, of course, because they don't want to carry the micro spikes in the ice axe. Mm. And he said people are so obsessive that they're literally cutting their toothbrushes in half. And years ago, people would carry 50 pound backpacks now they want to keep it at 35 pounds and he doesn't advise that. Um, uh, I, I also suggest that people check on the PCTA website as well because there's so much useful information there. You have to dig around for it sometimes, but, but it's there. 
I'm taking notes and we'll link to all of this in my follow-up email to all of you who've attended. Um, oh, more questions. Um, can you please tell us what you have noticed? I guess this is a question for all of you about the strengths of character and skills that seasoned and safety wise hikers have that we can all um, aspire to. What, what, what is the through line of uh, the skilled hikers, the, the people who really um, know what they're doing and um, succeed on, on incredibly serious hikes such as the PCT? I could maybe touch on that. One is, is pr preparation and do a lot of research. A lot of the PCT uh, hikers are, are experienced hikers and many of them have done you know, the Appalachian Trail and, and, and multi-day or multi-week hikes uh, uh, or trips. Um, so preparation, uh, know, know how to use, you know, mapping in your, in your gear. And uh, like Luis mentioned, ice axes. Um, but yeah, just a lot of preparation and, and, um, and, and planning. And fitness, fitness. It's good to, you know, to be fit when you're planning a, a big hike like this. Um, what are the blind spots, the, the weaknesses that hikers could be better aware of? I, I think the overconfidence. Uh, Cameron had said that many, many people who uh, start a through hike like the PCT um, are experienced. They are in great shape. They're, they're very experienced. Um, but have not been put into positions where they have to exercise great problem solving and decision making while on trail. In this particular section, it was more of a mountaineering experience than it was a hiking experience for Trevor. And um, in my opinion, people need to uh, take ownership of their decisions, of their actions, not be influenced by the people that they might be hiking with to assess their own skill set and compare it to the trail conditions ahead. And if those two are not aligned, there is no shame, there's no harm in backtracking, turning around and fault finding an alternate route around uh, the location that you wanna go to. And, and Beth, if, if you don't mind, I, I would like to say one more thing. And, and it's really, as it relates to Cameron and the RMRU, these are a group of volunteers. It is a self-funded organization that that my family owes, <clears throat> excuse me, more to than you can even imagine. Um, had Trevor been by himself, uh, he would, we'd still be out in Southern California looking for him. Fortunately, he was with two, two other gentlemen who were able to call 911 and Cameron and the rest of his team, Eric, they put their life on the line to bring my son home. They were swinging from hoists on helicopters that day, almost <clears throat> crashing into the side of the mountain. And um, they do this all because of their love for, to help each other, to help, help the hiking community and to save lives. But they are a self-funded organization. And I would just encourage people, especially the hikers on this call to please consider donating, whether it be to the RMRU or your local search and rescue. You can do that. And by the way, Cameron, I, I was prepared for this, www.rmru.org backslash donate. Um, your, your donations are going to save lives. I promise you that. Yeah, thank, um, thank you, Doug. Doug, you're incredible. I that um, someone commented up here, and, and a lot of people are really echoing it. I think it's it's important to share that you um, you you gave Trevor wings to fly. Parents sometimes we clip our kids' wings, and and sometimes their dreams. Um, and you very bravely didn't do that. I you know I think of my two year old on the slide and how terrified I get, and I I know how difficult it must have been for you to let Trevor follow his dream. So um, I think you're an extraordinary dad. Thank you. Um, and so what I would like to, on this very emotional note, and with you, um, I give you the floor. What is the one thing that you would like the attendees, there's over a hundred of us listening right now, what would you like us um, to leave with today? 
Um, <clears throat> one of the readers of, of Louise's article reached out to me uh, this week and recognized uh, my efforts to improve safety. And they left me with a quote that I will leave all of you. And they said, it's never a great adventure if you can never go home to tell a friend about it. So I would just ask to that everyone listening to share the message of safety, that that has to be your first priority, that you cannot finish the hike if you cannot finish the section, you cannot finish the section if you can't take the next step. So every step is just as important as the steps behind you and the steps in front of you. Um, so I would just ask people to help share and spread that message and to be safe out on the trail. With that, um, I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. Um, as I mentioned, this, this video that of this interview will be up on altaonline.com later today. I will send you all in email with that information, as well as links to a number of the things we mentioned, including this article and the RMRU donate link. Um, a huge thank you to Louise, Cameron, and of course, most especially Doug. I know we will be, um, I certainly will be thinking about today's conversation for a long time. And to our audience, thank you to everyone. We are so grateful that you took the time to, to join us today. So I encourage everyone to stay safe. Um, and again, many, many thanks to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.